The equation you see here, delta h equals delta g plus t delta s, may look familiar. It is one that expresses this behavior of energy that we've been looking at. And by virtue of explaining the behavior of energy, it also explains the laws of thermodynamics. So let's start making some statements of the first law. Let's try and put into math language what the first law says. And then we'll do the same thing to accommodate the second law. So the first thing is a very simple equation. It just says that total universal energy is equal to the sum of all the kinds of energy in the universe at any given moment. You obviously can add some of the other kinds of energy that are not on this list. Or, to make it very simple, the total amount of energy in the universe is simply the sum of all of the energy that is useful and all of the energy that is entropic or useless in the universe at any given moment. Let me say a, a word or two about universal energy and its constancy. To say it is constant means that the change in universal energy over time has got to equal zero. So this is another mathematical statement or construct that, that says the first law. It says that the change in universal energy is equal to zero. In other words, universal energy does not change. It's neither created nor is it destroyed. The Greek letter delta, as you probably know, just means change in. So when you see it in front of some term, it means change in that term. Well, we can also say then that the sum of the change in useful energy and the change in useless energy must also equal zero. That comes from the second equation near the top of this slide. If we do that, then we can solve for the change in useful energy. And that's shown in green right here. The change in useful energy is equal to minus the change in useless energy. This statement conforms to both the first and the second law of thermodynamics. And what is interesting about it is that it, it establishes or states a reciprocal relationship between the two quantities. Graphed this way, useful energy is always declining, and useless energy is always increasing reciprocally. I've introduced two terms here, stability and instability, which I haven't spoken of yet. So to give you an idea of what I mean, if entropy, which is rising, means disorder is rising, it also means that there is an increase in the stability of the universe. Imagine I have in my hand a bunch of paper clips all scrunched together in my fist, and I hold my fist over the instructor's table in class. And this I often do in the class. When I let go, of course, the paper clips, they're going to drop due to the force of gravity. And as they drop, they're going to spread out. And when they hit the counter, they'll spread out some more. So the paper clips, in dropping from a height, have experienced an increase in disorder, an increase in entropy. They did this because being on the table is a more stable state than being up in the air, unless I'm holding them, of course. And that's the concept of entropy as being or more stable than useful energy. Another way of saying this is that everything that happens in the world, every event, happens because something about the components and, or participants in the event is unstable, and spontaneously the components attempt to achieve some level of stability. So entropy is really the driving force in the universe. The second law is the driving force in the universe. It says entropy is always increasing in the universe, but what it really is saying is entropy will always increase in the universe, and as a result, things will happen. OK, I've given you a graph, and I've given you an equation, but you know, you can't really measure real numbers in universal terms. What you can do is measure the exchange of energy between isolated or closed systems within the universe, and we do this all the time. To do this, let's define a few terms. Let delta E useful, let the change in useful energy equal delta G. This was first done by a man named Gibbs, so we call it Gibbs free energy. And delta G is the change in Gibbs free energy. And let the change in useless energy, or the change in entropy, equal delta S. Now, let's take a system that's easy to understand and watch how energy change affects the system. We're going to define the system as a pot of water. It's an isolated system, i.e. a closed system. And we imagine that it has a finite internal energy content called E. Now, I admit that you can't know what the number is for the internal energy of that pot of water. But we can write this equation. Whatever it is, it's equal to the sum of the internal free energy and internal entropy of this pot of water. So we can write E equals G plus S. Now, if we put energy into the pot, say, to heat it, we know that the internal energy of the pot will change. How do we know that? I can put a thermometer 
into the water, and I can watch as I heat the water that the, that the temperature goes up. And as you probably know, for every increase of one degree of a, of a milliliter of water, the water has absorbed one calorie. So the definition of a calorie is the amount of energy absorbed by a milliliter of water as it rises one degree Celsius. So if we say Q is the energy used to heat the pot, we can say that Q is equal to, or will be reflected as, a change in the internal energy. Or we can say that it's simply equal to the change in free energy plus the change in entropy. So Q is the energy put into a system, the pot of water. By the way, it could also be the energy lost by the system, say when you turn the fire off and the pot of water simply cools down. And delta E, delta G, and delta S are the changes in internal energy, free energy, and entropy of the system, respectively. So here's that equation again, Q equals delta G plus delta S. By the way, this is beginning to look a bit like the equation we're trying to derive. Now if we define Q as delta H or enthalpy change, we can write an equation that looks even more like the one we're trying to get at. That's delta H equals delta G plus delta S. So now we have to tell you what delta H is. It is the change in equivalent heat content, that is to say the change in the energy moving in or out of the system, but measured in calories. What is that all about? Well, I could have heated the water not with calories of heat, but I could have heated it by, for example, taking two electrical wires that come from a, a, a plug that's plugged in the wall and holding the wires to that pot. As you can imagine, the pot is going to get hot. First you're going to see sparks, and then of course the pot itself will get very warm, and that heat in the metal of the pot is going to be transmitted to the water, and the water molecules will start to move, and that's what is in fact going to be the increase in temperature of the water in the pot. Well, electrical energy is measured in volts, but there's an equation that converts volts to calories, so I can tell you how much energy I have put into the pot of water by holding the electrodes there. But I can tell it to you in calories or in volts. So if I choose to tell it to you in calories, I can tell you the delta H, that is the increase in heat content of that pot. Well, from the third law of thermodynamics that says that entropy actually depends on temperature, what it says officially is that entropy is going to be at its lowest as you approach absolute zero, zero degrees Kelvin. Well, since entropy is dependent on temperature, we do factor temperature in when we look at energy changes, and so we have. Finally, we have the equation that I said we wanted to derive by considering the laws of thermodynamics and how they apply to living systems and non-living systems.